Okay, so we're going to complete our discussion of uh, Lebesgue measure and integration by discussing the big LP spaces, which was kind of the whole point of this endeavor, which was to um, find, uh, uh, in some sense, the complete space of integrable functions, whatever integrable means. I mean, we had to define an integral. Um, containing the, the space of continuous functions uh, with norm uh, given by, you know, let's say the integral of the pth power of, of um, the continuous function. So, um, okay, so at the end of, so at last lecture, we introduced the general Lebesgue integrable, I mean, uh, the class of Lebesgue integrable functions and the Lebesgue integral. And we proved that uh, we proved the dominated convergence theorem, and one consequence of that was the fact that um, if I have a continuous function on a closed and bounded interval a, b, then the Lebesgue integral of that continuous function e equals the Riemann integral of that continuous function. So, you know, you know how to compute integrals, um, or the Lebesgue integral for every function that you know how to compute the Riemann integral for. Uh, which are mostly um, continuous functions. Uh, now, this can be strengthened. One can show that, in fact, uh, so we're not going to cover it in, in this class. You'll see it in another class that is devoted maybe just solely to measure theory for a longer bit of time. But um, one can show, using the dominated convergence theorem, that, in fact, every Riemann integrable function, not just continuous, but every Riemann integrable function on a closed and bounded interval is um, Lebesgue integrable, um, and that the Riemann integral equals the Lebesgue integral, even just uh, for more general Riemann integrable functions. Um, and you can also now using the machinery that we've built up, I don't know, maybe I'll put this in the assignment, maybe not, um, that you can completely characterize those um, functions which are Riemann integrable. And the statement is that a function, a measurable function, say, um, is Riemann integrable if and only if it is continuous almost everywhere. Okay? I'm not saying that it's equal to a continuous function almost everywhere. I'm saying that it's continuous at almost every point in the interval. Okay? Okay. Now let's move on to um, analogs of the little LP spaces that we saw earlier in the lectures and on the assignments. Um, so these are the usually referred to as the big LP spaces. And uh, so to define these, let me first uh, define what will be, in the end, a norm. Um, so if f from a measurable subset of R to the complex numbers is measurable, and 1 is less than or equal to P is less than infinity, then we define the following um, possibly, uh, or the following extended non-negative real number. Um, norm LP of E, this is defined to be the integral over E of F raised to the, the absolute value raised to the P to the 1 over P. Okay? Now, this is meaningful because n no matter what F, uh, how F is behaved, because the absolute value of F raised to the P, this is a non-negative measurable function, so we can always define what the Lebesgue integral is. So this may be either infinite or finite, um, but it's a uh, non-negative uh, number, extended real number. And so maybe you ask, what's going on? Why did I leave out p equals infinity? Um, we have a different definition for p equals infinity, just ha like we had a different definition for um, the little l infinity. We define this quantity here, 
which I'm going to go ahead and start referring to as the LP and L infinity norms, even though I haven't proved there the norm a norm yet on what space either. This is defined to be the infimum over m positive, such that the measure of the set x and e, such that f of x is bigger than m equals 0. OK? So what does it mean for m to be in the set? This means that uh, f of x is less than or equal to m almost everywhere. And then I take the minimum of all such uh, almost everywhere upper bounds. OK? And this is usually referred to as what is called the essential supremum. Uh, f of x, OK? So, um, so just a, a little mini theorem about this L infinity norm here, um, which you'll see, well, I guess you'll be seeing these lectures after the first uh, um, exam. So you saw this guy actually on the exam. Um, and you proved one of these facts. The other I will put on a future assignment. Um, if f from e to c is measurable, then um, the absolute value of f of x is less than or equal to the L infinity. Uh, almost everywhere on E. And um, another fact, if F, if E is equal to AB, and F is continuous on AB, then um, this essential supremum is equal to, in fact, just the usual, what we call the L infinity norm, um, which remember was the soup over x and a b, absolute value of f of x. OK? So um, why do I state this? Because, you know, it the L infinity norm bounds f uh, from above for almost every x, in the same way that the little L infinity norm for sequences bounded the sequence, every entry in the sequence, you know, for every um, entry in the sequence. But now, for the essential supremum, we have a, just an almost everywhere statement. But um, this norm is the same as the L infinity norm or the infinity norm for continuous functions. Okay, so it shouldn't be something that's uh, too crazy. Um, OK, so now I'm just going to state a couple of theorems, because you already gave the proof, um, the proofs, I should say, uh, when you did, I think it was probably the first assignment, when you did the corresponding statements for little LP spaces, except now you replace the uh, for those, you replace uh, an integral with a sum. I mean, you should always think of as in, an integral as a sum. Um, so we have the following two theorems, two inequalities. We have Holder's inequality. If one is between p, if p is between one and infinity, and q is the dual exponent to p, meaning 1 over p plus 1 over q equals 1. And you have f is an lp of e, and g is an lq of e. Then f times g uh, integrated over e. Oh, I haven't even said, sorry, I'm getting way ahead of myself. So, and if 
f and g are two measurable functions, then the integral over e of f times g absolute value, this is less than or equal to the LP norm uh, of f times the LQ norm of g. Now, of course, this inequality is only interesting if the right-hand side is finite. Okay, if this is infinite, then this is all vacuously true. Um, okay, so this is uh, the analog of the holders inequality, which you proved for sequences, where we had a sum here uh, instead of the integral, and where we had a sum here instead of the integral. Okay, and it's proved in essentially the same way. You just replace a sigma with a little s. And so from Holder's inequality, you obtain Minkowski's inequality. If p is between 1 and infinity, and f, g are two measurable functions, then if I uh, take the LP norm of f plus g, this is less than or equal to the LP norm of f plus the LP norm of e. Okay, and again, you prove this exactly the same way uh, as you did for the little LP spaces uh, using Holder's inequality. Okay. Of course, you know, that requires a slightly different argument for p equals infinity, you know, for this essential supremum. But uh, in fact, that's what you did in the exam you took uh, a few days ago. Okay? So I've been calling these things a, a, a norm. Um, even though I haven't proved they're a norm yet, and on what space are they a norm, so now I'm going to do that. Um, so when it's clear, also let me make a small remark. Uh, I'll denote this thing just by shorthand with just a p, okay? And it should be clear from the context, you know, that I'm what set I'm taking this norm over, okay? Or what set am I taking this integral uh, that defines this uh, norm over? Okay, so now let me define the actual space that this will be a norm on, and it involves a slight abuse of terminology and notation in the end, which is just um, tradition, not just in this subject, but, you know, I mean, it's a, abuse of notation is, is tradition in all of math. Um, so for one, uh, for p between one and infinity, we define the space Lp of e. So e here is, uh, you know, if I don't say it, it's always a measurable subset of R. This is the set of all functions from E to C, which are measurable, that have finite LP norm. Okay? Now, um, let me make uh, a second caveat to this space. So as I've written it down now, it's a space of functions. Um, and I'm going to keep referring to it as a space of functions. I'm going to keep referring to elements of it as functions. But the actual space itself is not a space of functions. It's a space of equivalence classes in order for this quantity, which I keep calling a norm, to actually be a norm on this space. Uh, so let me add here. Um,
we consider two elements of this set, B, uh, shouldn't say equal, but to be the same element. And let me give uh, two elements, say F and G, in LP, to be the same element if F equals G almost everywhere. OK? So as I've written it down, LP of E consists of all measurable functions with finite LP norm. And now I'm saying that I will consider two um, elements in this space to be the same, to be the same element if they equal each other almost everywhere. So um, so strictly speaking, let me just make this as a remark. Um, this means an element of LP of E is an equivalence class uh, of the form, so little brackets F to indicate the equivalence class. I haven't told you what the uh, equivalence relation is, so I'll explain that as I describe the equivalence class. So the equivalence class of F is equal to the set of all function G, which are measurable OK? So you know, LP of E is really a set of all equivalence is a set of equivalence classes of measurable functions with finite LP norm where two um, equivalence classes are equal if and only if uh, the representative from the first equivalence class equals the representative of the second equivalence class almost everywhere. Okay, So this is what um, you know, LP of E is. Now why am I making this, um, you know, why am I adding this caveat that you have to equip consider two elements to be equal almost everywhere, um, because this is what allows me to put uh, or, or say this LP norm is an actual norm. Otherwise, it is just a semi-norm if I really consider LP of E to be this space of actual functions. Okay, So again, this is a small point All right, that LP of E is, in fact, a set of equivalence classes where two functions or two equivalence classes are equal if and only if the representative functions equal are equal almost everywhere. Okay. But now that I've explained all of that and carefully told you what LP of E is, it is customary to never refer to them as equivalence classes or elements of LP of E as an equivalence class. Okay. You usually still just refer to them as functions. Let me make that point clear. Rather than speaking of an equivalence class or elements of LP of E as an equivalence class, I will just refer to them as functions with the understanding that um, you know, two functions in LP of E are considered to be the same function, the same element, if they equal each other almost everywhere. OK? Now, you know. Maybe you think this is a little weird, but you've been doing this your whole life already, okay? Because the rational numbers themselves are defined, if you look 
back into algebra, if you're taking algebra now, when you actually sit down and construct the rational numbers, they're constructed as equivalence classes, right, of pairs of integers. But, you know, you don't think of them as that. You think of them as, you know, 3 over 2, right? Not the equivalence class of 3, 2, right? So, again, two elements in LP of E. I mean, we think of LP of E as uh, a set of functions with finite LP norm and with the caveat that two functions are, or two elements of LP and E, LP of E are equal, are the same element if the two functions agree almost everywhere, okay? Okay, now with that minor detail out of the way, let's move on to, uh, let me state um, the theorem that So LP with the natural scalar multiplication where you just multiply a fun the scalar multiple of an element is just multiplying the function by a scalar. And the sum of two elements is just the pointwise sum of the two functions. So with the obvious uh, definitions of scalar multiplication and addition, operations is a vector space moreover this function which i've been referring to as a norm is actually a norm on lp okay now i'm not going to I'm only going to prove, um, you know, part of this, uh, you know, because to verify something is a vector space, you have to verify the operations are, uh, you know, satisfy certain um, properties, um, you know, and when I state the, or give the proof of what I'm going to prove out of this theorem, you know, I'm, this will be the last time I actually refer to the fact that these are equivalence classes and not functions, but, um, just to, to, you know, make a point, you know, um, you know, again, this space, strictly speaking, is a set of equivalence classes. So one would have to check that addition and scalar multiplication are well defined uh, on this set, meaning um, if I have two representatives of the same equivalence class and I multiply one by a scalar and the other by a scalar, then I get the same equivalence class in the end, okay? Um, which is easy to check, and the same for addition. So, um, again, in the, um, you know, strictly speaking, since that LP is a set of equivalence classes, these things are well defined, uh, scalar multiplication and addition, all right? Um, so let's, check that uh, LP, or that this quantity here is a norm, okay? And I'm just going to, um, so first off, note that taking the LP norm of an element of LP is actually well-defined. Remember, so, you know, this is going to be the only theorem and proof where I actually refer to the fact that LP is actually a set of equivalence classes. And then after that, we just won't uh, do that anymore, and we'll just think of LP as a set of functions where two functions are the same element if they equal each other almost everywhere. But first thing to note is that um, this is actually well defined on uh, this set of equivalence classes. So note if uh, if I have two representatives of an equivalence class. then by what we developed for the Lebesgue integral, so f, take the absolute value raised to the p, is also going to be equal to a g, absolute value raised to the p, almost everywhere, and therefore these two integrals are going to equal each other. Right? These integrals are real numbers. They're not equivalence classes of real numbers. This is a real number, a non-negative real number. Um, 
and therefore if in the notation I had before, if I have uh, an equivalence class and I have two different representatives of this and I define you know, the LP norm of this equivalence class to be the integral of the representative, I get the same number uh, regardless of the representative for that equivalence class. Um, i.e. Okay, so uh, this function is defined by, uh, if I take the LP norm of an equivalence class given by just the integral of the representative, this is well defined. If I take two different representatives, I get the same number out, okay? Um, Now, this quantity here equals zero if and only if, uh, by what we've um, developed in our theory of integration, f equals zero almost everywhere, right? So the LP norm, or the, so I should say this equals zero almost everywhere, i.e., f equals zero almost everywhere but possibly not everywhere, the equivalence class of this function is equal to the zero element, okay? So this was the whole reason why we, I went through this trouble of actually explaining to you why, um, you know, strictly speaking, the most rigorous uh, way of defining LP is as a space of equivalence classes, even though we won't think about them that way. Uh, or talk about them that way in the future, that's in fact what they are. Because then this quantity here, this LP norm, is in fact a norm. If uh, the LP norm is zero, then uh, that element is the zero element, okay? Okay, so that's about the last time I'm ever gonna refer to the elements of LP as equivalence classes. I will now be referring to them as you know, functions. Uh, but uh, homogeneity and the triangle inequality for um, the LP norm then follow simply from the definition for homogeneity, you know, the fact that a scalar uh, that the LP norm of a scalar multiple of f is equal to the uh, absolute value of the scalar times the LP norm of f, and the triangle inequality follow from the definition, and Minkowski's inequality. Okay, so LP is the space of measurable functions with finite LP norms. See, I'm already not going to refer to it ever again as a space of equivalence classes. You should think of them as a space of functions, just with two elements equal if they, uh, if these functions equal each other almost everywhere, point-wise on E. Um, now, uh, we come to the big question. We now have this norm space, LP of E, uh, corresponding to all these um, functions that have finite LP norm. Um, you know, first off, is this non, is this non empty? Uh, let's, let's maybe give you the simplest example. In fact, let me prove the following simple theorem. So, uh, which is the following. 
let E be measurable, then F is in LP of E if and only if the limit as R goes to infinity over uh, of the integral of minus R to R intersect E of F raised to the P is finite, OK? Notice as R going to plus infinity, uh, so maybe let's not make it R. We can make it N, where N is a natural number, OK? Then this is an increasing sequence of numbers. So uh, let's give the proof real quick. Let's assume uh, F is in LP. implies that um, this quantity here is finite since the sequence of integrals over minus n to n uh, intersect E, f raised to the p. This is an increasing sequence, right, because uh, at each step at each uh, entry, I'm taking the integral of this non-negative quantity over a bigger, a bigger set, right? So this is an increasing sequence. Um, so in fact, this limit always exists, so it was meaningful to actually refer to this limit. Since this is an increasing sequence, um, limit as n goes to infinity minus n intersect E actually exists as a possibly uh, extended real number. Now, since for all n, we have that the integral of minus n to n intersect E, f uh, raised to the p, is less than or equal to, well, um, in fact, I'm being a little inefficient here. Let's just erase one bit here. OK, yeah, let's do it this way. We'll do it much faster. Um, now note that uh, intersect E, F raised to the P, this is equal to integral over E, chi minus N to N, F raised to the P. So I can think of this as, um, I can think of what's here in the integrand as a function for each n. So since uh, this is a sequence that is pointwise increasing, And uh, for all x and e, we have limit as n goes to infinity of chi minus n to n, um, f of x raised to the p equals f of x raised to the p. This implies by the monotone convergence theorem that uh, the integral of the limit as n goes to infinity, which is just f raised to the p, is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of 
the integral of this quantity here over e, which is again the integral over minus n to n intersect e raised to the p. And therefore, this quantity here is finite if and only if this quantity here is finite. And therefore, f is an LP if and only if um, this quantity here is finite and in fact they equal each other. Okay? So using uh, you know that theorem, if you like, um, you can prove, and I'll leave it to you, that uh, if f from, let's say, r to c is measurable and there exists a constant non-negative and q bigger than 1, such that for almost every x and r, f of x is less than or equal to a constant times 1 plus x raised to the minus q, then um, f is an LP of r for all p bigger than or equal to 1. OK? So um, how do you do that? So OK, maybe I'll just indicate why we use the previous theorem uh, and look at the integral uh, from minus n to n intersect r. So this here by this estimate is less than or equal to the integral from minus n to n over times constant 1 plus uh, x to the minus q. Now, this is a continuous function over a compact or, or closed and bounded interval. So uh, this is equal to its Riemann integral. I will often, you know, on exams and so on, write the Lebesgue integral also in this form, though. Um, so I don't want to say that I'm just going to use this kind of notation for uh, the Riemann integral. But anyways, so, and I leave it to you to show that as long as q is bigger than 1, uh, this is less than or equal to, so I should put p times q, p times q that as long as uh, as long as q is bigger than 1, this uh, integral here is less than or equal to um, some constant depending on p. OK? All right. OK, so you know, there's many functions uh, that are in LP. So it's not exactly a trivial uh, space. Um, but what kind of space is it? Now let me state the following, that um, in fact, this is what you proved in, in the assignment right before or the assignment I at least um, assigned before the exam, which was the following. Let A less than B less than B, and P between 1 and infinity. So in fact, you did it for L1, but the kind of same proof carries over for LP. Um, FB in LP of AB. I keep adding stuff and epsilon be positive. Then there exists a continuous function in AB, which I can also impose vanishes at the endpoints 
and is close to F in LP norm. So what this states is that the space of continuous functions is dense in LP of AB, okay? And it's a proper subset of LP of AB, okay? Right? I can find elements um, in LP that are not continuous, okay, or even not equal to a continuous function almost everywhere. Okay, so is uh, uh, dense and also proper. Okay, um, and now the final theorem we'll prove about integration in LP spaces is that uh, LP is uh, complete. So this is due to Reese and Let's see, does this have a C or is it just, yeah, it does have a C. This is a Banach space for P between 1 and infinity, okay? Uh, including 1 and infinity. Now I'll give the proof for um, P between uh, strictly less than infinity, so. P equals infinity. This is, uh, will appear in an assignment. So we'll do the case uh, P between 1 and infinity. Okay. Um, so how are we going to do this? We are going to, in fact, use um, that criterion from several weeks ago about when is a norm space a Banach space. So we proved uh, this equivalent criterion. So remember, a Banach space is a, is a norm space that's complete with respect to the norm. So you would have to check that all Cauchy sequences in the space converge to something in the space, right? Um, but now, we came up with this other criterion I shouldn't say we did, somebody did, and then I showed it to you, that uh, an equivalent way to prove that is to prove that all absolutely summable series in the norm space are summable, okay? Remember, absolutely summable means the sum of the norms is finite. So that's what we're going to use, or that's what we're going to do. We will show that every absolutely summable series is summable, okay? So, um, suppose I have a sequence in LK. The sequence in L F is an L P, not L K. That form an absolutely summable uh, series, so such that sum over K of if I take the L P norm of F K, so this is now a series of non-negative numbers. Uh, let's assume this converges, meaning this. I'm writing it as this. Uh, um, is uh, finite, okay? So, in fact, this equals a, uh, let me call this uh, convergent series something, call it M, which is a finite number, okay? All right, so we have this um, absolutely summable series, and we want to prove that now the series, sum of fk's, converge to something in LP.
Okay, and what do we want to show now? So let me just, so that that's clear ahead of time. We want to show there exists a function in LP such that uh, k equals 1 to n, the partial sums converge to f as n goes to infinity in LP of E, i.e., equivalent way of writing that is that the limit as n goes to infinity of the norm sum k equals 1 to n of fk minus fp equals 0. Okay? That will show that every summable series is absolutely summable series is summable. Okay? So, we have to identify a candidate f and then show that the norm uh, of, that this norm here goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Okay, so define gn from e to, uh, so it's a non-negative number, or it's a non-negative function by a the n of x equals sum from k equals 1 to n of the absolute value of fk of x. Okay? This is, again, a measurable function because it's the sum of measurable functions. So what do we know? By the triangle inequality, we know that... Um, If I take uh, the LP norm of GN, which is this finite sum, so by the triangle inequality for the LP norm, this is less than or equal to sum from k equals 1 to n of the LP norms of the FKs. And uh, this is a partial sum corresponding to the you know, series of the norms of fk's which uh, sum to m. So this is always less than or equal to m, right? Which we're assuming, again, is a finite number. And therefore, which implies by uh, Fatou's lemma, that the lim imp as n goes to infinity of g sub n over e, which is equal to, now, for each x, uh, this, uh, so as n goes to infinity, for, for each x as n goes to infinity, this converges to something. It's either finite or, in, you know, equal to infinity. So it always converges. So uh, this is equal to um, the infinite sum. I should say. Let's raise this to the p, which is equal to Uh, so, okay, I kind of got this backwards. I should have said this is equal to this. Uh, but anyways, um, by Fatou's lemma, so let me reverse these things. So by Fatou's lemma, so I have this is equal to, so this is not, use fat 2, it just uses uh, the definition of gn. This is less than or equal to, now I'm using fat 2's lemma, integral over e, gn raised to the p. And now, 
I use that bound, which I have right here. This is always less than or equal to, uh, remember, the LP norm of G sub N was less than or equal to M. So raising that to the P power, I have this is less than or equal to M to the P. All right, so I started off with uh, the integral of this non-negative measurable function, which is the series of F sub K raised to the P and showed that that integral is finite, right? Thus, so by another theorem that we proved from integration, right, if I have a non-negative measurable function that has finite integral, then that measurable function has to be finite almost everywhere, right? So thus, this quantity has to converge or is finite uh, for almost every x and e. So what I get is that for almost, uh, let me include an x in here. So I've proven for almost every x in E, uh, fk of x uh, is you know, absolutely convergent. So this series is absolutely convergent. And therefore, it converges for almost every x in E. And I'll define my function way, right? Because in the end, remember, we're trying to find a function f so that these partial sums converge to f and lp. So if we can define f at somehow as the almost everywhere uh, pointwise limit of s of k, maybe we can use the dominated convergence theorem in some way, and that's, that'll be what we do. Um, so define. Uh, f of x to be exactly what I get from this convergent series when it converges, absolutely. So if and zero otherwise, and I'm going to define g of x to be, again, uh, if you like, it's the when the g sub n's converge. So if this is finite and zero otherwise. Okay, so now I have these two measurable uh, real valued functions, and this guy will end up being um, what the fk's converge to. So then we have a couple of things. Then limit as n goes to infinity of sum from k equals 1 to n f k of x put a minus f of x equals 0 almost everywhere on e. Why is that? This is just because f of x is simply defined to be the infinite sum when this sum is absolutely convergent, which is almost everywhere by what we've done, OK? Um, what else? If I, so this is uh, one crucial thing. And minus f of x, this is less than or equal to g of x, so to the p, raised to the p, almost everywhere on e. OK, why is this? Um, this holds, for example, when the series is absolutely convergent, right? Because then f of x is equal to the infinite sum of the fk's of x, right? And so by the triangle inequality, the absolute value of that difference is going to be less than or equal to uh, the sum of the absolute values. That's by definition equal to g sub n, or g sub n plus 1. g is the 
limit of the g sub n, so g sub n's are increasing, so that always sits below g of x, okay? Okay. Now, by, I should say, by this, I don't want to pull it up, but so let's just say, since uh, we proved that the LP norm of this is less than or equal to M, right, which this here is equal to G almost everywhere. This implies that the LP norm of G is equal to this LP norm, and therefore is less than or equal to M, and therefore uh, that means the LP norm raised to the P is finite, okay? Moreover, what else do we deduce? Uh, we also deduce from this that F, which is bounded above by almost everywhere by this quantity, uh, this is less than or equal to, which is equal to G almost everywhere. The LP norm of F is less than or equal to the LP norm of G, which as we said is less than or equal to M, i.e., F is an LP of E, okay? So again, almost everywhere we have that F, which is equal to the sum without the absolute values, that's always less than or equal to an absolute value, uh, the sum from K equals the sum over K with absolute values inside, okay? And we know that the LP norm of this is finite, we proved that earlier, which tells me that the LP norm of G is finite because G is equal to this quantity almost everywhere. It's zero on a set of measure zero, which we just threw in there to make it finite. Um, so we have F uh, is an LP. We have G is an LP. So at least this can be a possible candidate. And we have these two um, facts here. Now, we apply the dominated convergence theorem. Using this fact, right, this we have converging to zero almost everywhere uh, on E. And since that's true, I can put, if you like, a raised to the P. So this quantity here is converging to zero almost everywhere. This quantity is also bounded above by uh, this quantity here on the right, which is integrable, right? It has the integral of G to the P is finite. So by the dominated convergence theorem, I can conclude that. Um, the limit as n goes to infinity of sum from k equals 1 to n of the fk's minus f raised to the p over e, this equals uh, the integral of the limit, which, remember, is 0, i.e., we've shown that which is what we wanted to prove. Now, of course, you need a different argument for p equals infinity, um, and it's a little bit simpler. But uh, um, so we've proved that LP is a Banach space. All right? And you know, notice we used a, a kind of a lot of different um, tools and things that we had uh, developed over the course of this over the course of this course um, so far. You know, I keep using this word completion even though we haven't really talked about it. I kind of left it out of the first chapter because I wasn't going to use the second chapter uh, from the lecture notes um, that are usually uh, um, used for this course. But, um, you know, from this fact, 
so you should think of the completion as kind of the smallest Banach space containing a certain um, norm space. But what this statement here, along with the theorem due to Reese and Fisher, is that the completion of continuous functions over AB with norm given by the LP norm, which is in fact a norm on continuous functions, because if a continuous function is equal to zero almost everywhere, it has to be zero. So what this proves is that the completion of the continuous functions with this norm is equal to the space LP. Okay. All right. Um, so now we're going to move on to uh, back to kind of some more general theory of functional analysis. This was kind of uh, you know, specific to uh, measure and integration on the real numbers. Now we're going to go to more general topics. Um, and probably more intuitive topics because um, a lot of it has analogs. I mean, you know, a lot of functional analysis has, is supposed to be in some way analogous to stuff you've seen in linear algebra. Some of it definitely is not. For example, um, you know, in one of the assignments you proved that uh, the unit ball in little lp is not compact for, um, you know, over the natural numbers, the set of sequences that have little finite at little lp norm, that that's not compact, while, you know, from calculus that, uh, in Rn, the unit ball is compact. That's the heine borel theorem, or bolzano weierstrass depending on if you take as your starting definition of compactness uh, in terms of open sets or in terms of sequences having a convergent subsequence, which are equivalent for metric, and at least in a metric space. OK, now here we're going to move on to uh, the topic of Hilbert spaces. So um, these these are uh, you know special in the sense that the norm comes from uh, an inner product, maybe you saw an inner product in, in linear algebra, um, or you should have at least. Um, and therefore, you have notions of being orthogonal, you have notions of projections, and these, you know, we kind of saw things that uh, kind of have that flavor when we were talking about Banach spaces in general, and we were talking about, uh, um, you know, modding out by a subspace, then you can think of the equivalence class corresponding to an element as so, sort of the projection onto the complement of that uh, uh, subspace, but you know it wasn't an exact analogy. Um, but a lot of exact analogies will now occur for Hilbert spaces, and then certain um, operators on Hilbert spaces will be, you know, very analogous to um, to self-adjoint uh, matrices or, or symmetric matrices, uh, which you saw in linear algebra. Um, and of course, from an applied standpoint, um, I should say applied, um, Hilbert spaces, this is where you know, the action, uh, this is where the setting of quantum mechanics. Okay, quantum mechanics takes place in a Hilbert space. Um, you know, the elements are square integrable, now that we've dealt with that, functions uh, over R3, if we're in three dimensions, or if we're on the line R, um, that have L2 norm equal to one, right? Um, along with the Schrodinger equation. But, so Hilbert spaces are very important. Um, they arise naturally in many problems. Uh, and um, because of this additional structure of them, of the norm coming from an inner product, um, you know, you can say kind of uh, a lot more things about them. Um, okay, so 
before we get to Hilbert spaces, let me add a pre before that. So pre Hilbert spaces. So I said that Hilbert spaces are going to be uh, Banach spaces that come from the norm. Pre Hilbert spaces, these are just normed spaces that come from an inner product. So let me make the following definition. Um, a pre-Hilbert space H, this is a vector space, typically over C, but you can also just take it over R, all right, that's fine as well. Uh, but I'll just, for definiteness, say over C, with Hermitian inner product. Okay. So this is new terminology. Maybe this is new terminology too, but so let me uh, write out what it means. Uh, what is a Hermitian inner product? So this is, i.e., a map, usually uh, denoted using brackets, from h cross h into the complex numbers satisfying certain properties so such that so one uh, it is linear in uh, the first variable so for all lambda 1 lambda 2 v1 v2 if I look at the inner product of v1, lambda 1 times v1 plus lambda 2 times v2 with w, this is equal to lambda 1 times v1 times the inner product with w plus lambda 2, v2 inner product with w. Um, 2 for all v, w, and Oh, I wrote capital V. I should have wrote, written H a minute ago. Now we're in Hilbert spaces, pre-Hilbert spaces. For all V and W, the inner product of V and W is equal to the complex conjugate of the inner product of W with V. And the following, which is positive definiteness if you, of uh, the inner product, if you'd like to call it that, for all V and H, the inner product of V with itself, this is bigger than or equal to zero, so it's a real number, and it's non-negative, and this quantity equals zero if and only if V is a zero element. Okay, um, so let me make a, a couple of remarks. Uh, first off, um, let's say this is remark one. Uh, the third quantity does imply that the only thing orthogonal to everything in the space is a zero element. So if V is in uh, H and V is orthogonal to everything, I keep using the word orthogonal. Um, I should just say inner product with zero. Uh, it gives me zero for every element. Uh, this implies that V equals zero. And of course, the converse uh, applies too. If V is equal to zero, then uh, the inner product with zero and every element is zero just by linearity. Uh, the two, two is that. Um, if I have two elements, V and W, and a scalar uh, lambda, then this is equal to the complex conjugate of lambda times W with V. And by the first uh, property, the lambda pops out. And therefore, if I 
complex conjugate of a product is a product of the complex conjugates. And then if I undo this, I can get this. So um, it's linear in the first uh, entry, meaning the constants just come out. But if I have a constant in the second, or a scalar multiple uh, in the second entry, then that comes out as well, but with a complex conjugate over it. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. So I said that uh, pre hilbert spaces are, uh, you naturally kind of think of them as norm spaces where the norm comes from the inner product. Uh, here we have inner product. Where's the norm? Um, so definition, if H is a pre hilbert space, with inner product denoted uh, as before, we define uh, using this. So I'm not calling it a norm yet. I'm just saying we call we define this function on H and to be the inner product of V with itself raised to the one half power. Okay. In the end, or in a minute, we'll show that this is in fact a norm. Okay. But for now, I'm just going to call it this uh, um, function on H or uh, possible norm on H. All right, so we have the following theorem. So this is valid in any pre Hilbert space. Um, for all u, v, and h, a pre-Hilbert space, uh, if I take the absolute value of the inner product of u and v, this is less than or equal to um, this norm-looking thing of u times the norm-looking thing of v. So. Um, This shouldn't come as a complete surprise. Write down, you know, if we took H to be Rn, and so then now this is a, a, you know, vector space over R, then, and the inner product to just be the dot product. This is stating, you know, the Cauchy Schwartz inequality that you know and love from before. So, what's the proof? Let's let, uh, f of t be the norm of u plus t times v. So I said norm, but I haven't proved it's a norm yet, so you're going to have to forgive if I keep calling it a norm. Uh, but in the end, it is. Let f of t be this thing squared, which we note it's a non-negative number, right? Because the inner product of v with v is a non-negative number, taking that to the 1 half power. So this is. Uh, u plus t v inner product u plus t v, which is non-negative. Okay. Now, if we compute all this out, uh, using how the linearity works for inner products, this uh, I get u inner product u plus t squared v inner product v plus t times u inner product v plus t times the inner product of v with u. And this is the complex conjugate of this complex number. So let me just rewrite this. u squared plus t squared or v squared plus, so again, this number is the complex conjugate of this number. And when I add a complex number to its complex conjugate, I get twice times the real part. 2t real part of u and v. Okay? Now, uh, this is just a polynomial, right? With a non negative uh, thing out in front of t squared. So it has a minimum somewhere. 
and this minimum has to be non-negative since this function is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, is greater than or equal to zero, uh, or I should say, just as a sentence. Now, where does this minimum occur? It occurs where the derivative is equal to zero. Now, f prime of t min equals zero implies, or if and only if, t min is equal to minus the real part. So I will leave this calculus to you. I mean, this is just a polynomial. Take the derivative with respect to t and solve for when that's equal to zero. Um, and therefore, I get that this minimum, so f evaluated at this point, is non-negative. So zero is less than or equal to f of t min, which when you stick that into uh, this here, you get norm of u squared minus real part of u v squared over norm of v squared, okay? And therefore, the real part of u v, absolute value. So this, all of this is bigger than or equal to zero, so if I move this over to that side, multiply by norm squared, take the square root, I get that this is less than or equal to, so let me put a, u times norm v. Okay, so this is almost what I want. Uh, I want the absolute value of the inner product with u and v, but all I have is the real part of inner product with u and v. Um, so of course, if the inner product of u and v is zero, this inequality I want to prove is, is automatic. Um, also, if u or v is zero, then this uh, Inequality I wanted to prove is automatic, so you know that's why I'm actually just dealing with a non-trivial case. So, uh, if this inner product is zero, then we're already done because the right-hand side is non-negative. So, suppose this is non-zero, let lambda be this complex number u v inner product. Uh, complex conjugate over the absolute value, okay? Then the absolute value of this complex number is equal to one because the absolute value of uh, the conjugate is equal to the absolute value of the original complex number. And um, lambda times uv which is equal to uh, lambda, so I should say, uv. This is equal to um, lambda times uv, which is equal to lambda u times v. Um, now, this is equal to this, and therefore it's equal to the real part of it. Right, so this is equal to a real number, and therefore it's equal to its real part. We pulled a similar trick when we were talking about the triangle inequality for, um, you know, integrable functions that now take values in the complex number, complex number. So this is equal to the real part of this, which is less than or equal to um, by what we've done here. We've already proven this inequality holds for every u and v, so. It also holds for lambda times u times v. And now, um, so simple off to the side, that if I take lambda u, an inner product with lambda u, if I take the one half power of that, that gives me this quantity. But let me just compute this. This is equal to lambda comes out from here, and then complex conjugate of lambda comes out from there. And this is equal to
but this is equal to 1. So we see that uh, this is equal to this, and therefore, raising it to the 1 half power is equal to, um, yeah, this quantity here is equal to this quantity. And we've proven what we wanted to do. All right? OK. And so this was a Cauchy Schwartz inequality um, in a general pre Hilbert space with this quantity that I've referred to as a norm, but I haven't proved it's a norm yet. Uh, next time, we will use the Cauchy Schwartz inequality to prove that, in fact, this thing that I'm masquerading around in a norm notation is, in fact, a norm on uh, uh, a pre-Hilbert space. Okay, and uh, from there we'll introduce Hilbert spaces, um, which uh, are those pre-Hilbert spaces with this norm that are actually complete. Um, and really, for any kind of so for for, and we'll prove this in, uh, at some point. There's really only two types of reasonable Hilbert spaces. Um, and I mean this in a very strong sense, not in a loose sense. Um, that the first type is just finite dimensional. So think of C raised to the n. So n tuples of complex numbers where the inner product is definable in, in a natural way. or uh, little l2, which is, uh, you know, these, s this set of sequences uh, that have finite little l2 norm, right? This is basically the only other type of Hilbert space that there is, and I'll say what I mean by that. Um, how it'll work is once, is we'll basically show that um, every separable Hilbert space, which is what I mean by um, reasonable, it's, you know, kind of the most reasonable spaces we work with are separable, um, meaning they have a countable dense subset, has a countable orthonormal basis, which is what uh, orthonormal basis I haven't defined. It's not a Hamel basis, but it serves kind of the same purpose, um, meaning you can't write every element as a finite linear combination of orthonormal basis but you can write it as an infinite expansion in an orthonormal basis. Think, uh, you know, Fourier series. Um, and this is what provides this identification of a separable Hilbert space with either, you know, uh, C to the n if this orthonormal basis is finite, or little l2 if this orthonormal basis is countably infinite. Okay, and, and we'll get to that possibly by the end of next lecture.